All right, here we go. I'll tell you the question I'm going over too. I'm, if anyone's interested, I'm going over number 28. Like no one's interested. Are you interested? Oh, you just oh, I see. Okay, ready? Here we go. Write this down. Write this down. Mass cells. Write write this down. I'm not gonna write it down. You are. Mass cells are located in all tissues of your body. All the tissue of your body contains mass cells. And if it's a cell, does it have a cell membrane? See? Yeah. And inside mast cells, there are stored chemicals called histamines. You got me? Write this down. When mast cells rupture due to tissue damage, when mast cells rupture due to tissue damage, what's inside a mast cell? And it releases histamine. And histamines do two things. Number one, they are massive arterial vasodilators. So, if the arteries in that damaged tissue area dilate, what's going to happen to the amount of arterial blood that goes there? It's going to be more, right? And we know that arterial blood is red and warm. You got me? Second thing is that it increases capillary leakiness. It makes it punches holes in the capillary membrane and it makes them leaky. You got me? If you punch a hole in a balloon, the water will leak out, right? Okay. All right, that's number one. All right, this is going to be a hard question, so I'm going to give you time to answer it and think about it. All right, you ready? Uh, where are white blood cells? Where? In the blood. Are you writing that down? Okay. Write this down. What's the most numerous type of white blood cell floating in your blood? Nice. Neutrophils. Oh, I kind of like this color. Is that an A or an L or O? Is that an A? Neutral. Okay. Neutrophils. It's an A. All right. Watch. Oh, it's an O. Okay. All right. Watch. When neutrophils, when they come in contact, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this all together. When they come in contact, contact. When they come in contact with an antigen or pathogen, you got me, antigen or pathogen, the neutrophil releases chemicals. And these chemicals are called chemoattractants. And I'm going to simplify that for him. These chemoattractants that the neutrophil releases, yeah, attract other white blood cells to the area. So it's like leaving a bread uh, crumb trail. Okay, guys, over here, follow the little trail. So if you got a if you got a boil on your butt, boy, basically that's infection, right? Bacteria got there, and 
the neutrophils, all those white blood cells are accumulating to destroy that infection. That's why the area becomes red and warm and painful. I'll explain that in a minute. T tell me you're following this so far. Okay. All right. These chemoattractants, there's a bunch of them, but these are the ones that you should know, right? One is uh, histamine. We know that histamines are released by mast cells too, right? Histamines are released by white blood cells. Then you have prostaglandins. And then you have these things called interleukins. All right. Now, watch. I want to talk to you about prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, when they're released from white blood cells, they do a lot of stuff. One of the things that they'll do is they will increase inflammation. So they will dilate arteries even more and prolong that effect. And it will make the capillaries more leaky. The other thing they do is they stimulate these receptors called nociceptors. And nociceptors, noce, noxious, painful. So these are pain receptors. And then finally, prostaglandins can um, produce fever. Interleukins, they can also produce fever, but prostaglandins are probably more potent. Are you with me? All right. So I'm going to explain to you now the process of inflammation, right? And I'm going to ask you questions about this. And then I'm going to give you uh, some clinical insight to why I understand this is important. All right. You know what could sing was Elvis. That guy was supremely talented. I'm like, damn. Even when he was dying, he looked like death warmed over. His voice, like, he could still sing. I'm like, damn. That's talent. All right. Here we go. Let me label this little thing. These are mast cells. What do mast cells contain? One more time. Come on. They contain histamines, right? If the... Mass, uh, the histamine is in the mast cell. Can it produce arterial vasodilation? No. But let's say, for example, that someone didn't like you. Now, of course, we know that's never going to happen. And they didn't like you, and they took a broom handle, and they stabbed it into you. Ooh. Right? What's the best protection you have against infection? intact skin. So if you unintact the skin, now bacteria have a direct access to your body, right? Now watch. One of the reasons bite wounds or puncture wounds are so infective is they don't bleed. Bleeding of a wound is actually good for you because it will actually push out any potential pathogen that's trying to enter. That's why puncture wounds get so infected. My little uh, brother, he was in so much pain, he would bite his hand and he actually bit through the skin on his hand. So his hand got infected. So he's in the hospital like for five days. Poor kid. Anyways, watch. These little uh, green things that look like Tic Tacs are bacteria. Now, you've damaged tissue. And when you damage tissue, you rupture mast cells. 
And what do mast cells release when they're ruptured? And what do histamines cause? They're going to cause local arterial vasodilation. And listen up because this is true. The amount of inflammation that you get is directly proportional to the amount of tissue that's damaged. So the more inflammation you get, the more tissue has been damaged because the more mast cells you ruptured. So you're going to get arterial vasodilation. So more warm red arterial blood is going to go to that area. So that area will become red, red, and warm. What's the other effect of histamines? It makes the capillaries leaky. So histamines actually punch holes in the capillary wall. And I'll show you this in a minute. Okay. Watch. Watch. It's going to work. See, it's red and throbbing. Ow. 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 There goes the histamines vasodilation, and then it punches holes in the capillary. You got me? Now watch. If you recall, we talked about blood flow through arteries, right? Remember that? And I explained to you that blood flow through the arterial system flows in a laminar fashion. The watery part, the plasma of the blood flows on the outside, and the formed elements, white blood cells, red blood cells, form uh, flow in the middle. Well, if this exists, then the white blood cells are not going to be able to come close to the capillary wall. And white blood cells have the ability to attach themselves to the capillary wall and then squeeze through the cracks that were created by that histamine. It's called diapedesis. And I don't care what anybody says. That would be a great name for a band. It's here for diapedesis. Anyways, watch. So... Because of these little pores, these little openings in the capillary, fluid leaves the capillary and gets caught in the interstitial space. So what happens to that area? It becomes red, warm, and swollen. Tell me you got that. The purpose of, that cap the, of the fluid leaving the capillary is that's going to increase interstitial fluid pressure. And it is going to prevent any of these green tic tacs, which are bacteria, from entering the capillary and getting into the central circulation. So it's essentially trying to push the bacteria out and prevent it from getting into the blood. So as you can see, that's beneficial, right? So if we get rid of this, come on, oh, all right. Now you have these white blood cells that have attached themselves to the wall of the capillary. And their job will be to squeeze through these little pores, end up in the interstitial space, and then these white blood cells will begin to attack and destroy these bacteria. How does this white blood cell, this neutrophil, know that these are bacteria? How does it, why doesn't it recognize it? That's right. All the cells of your body have a group of proteins that identify it uh, as you. It's called the major histocompatibility complex. You like that? Okay, good. Say that to a security guard. They'll give you their radio. Yeah. All right. Bacteria don't have the major histocompatibility complex, so... White blood cells, in this case neutrophils, identify these as foreign and will attack them and destroy them. Here's, here's the big point. When bacteria come in contact with pathogens, it's very important, and they're going to come in contact a little bit. There they go. They squeeze through these small cracks. What color are white blood cells? <laughs> I'm sorry. See them eating them? Look at that. Mm -hmm. When they come in contact with a pathogen, white blood cells release 
chemoattractants. And these chemoattractants we know are histamines, interleukins, prostaglandins, correct? So when you release prostaglandins, what happens is these prostaglandins will increase that inf uh, inflammatory response. It's going to make the arteries dilate even more, make the capillaries even more leaky. And you have pain receptors all around your body, right? These nociceptors and prostaglandins are going to stimulate these uh, nociceptors. So you're going to get pain. Now, pain is good for you. Pain tells you something's wrong, right? So watch. If you jack up your ankle, it's painful to put weight on it, right? So if you're having pain, it disables that joint or whatever, that, that body part, and prevents you from using it. Because pain tells you something's wrong, and if you do something and it produces more pain, you shouldn't do it. You're doing more damage. That's why the old joke, the doctor said, uh, hey, doc, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. That's good advice. Don't do that. That's why they immobile joints when they're hurt. They cast an ankle if it's, you know, you sprain it, not cast it, but immobilize it, right? You don't want to be doing that because you're going to produce more damage. The other thing is that prostaglandins formed by white blood cells, they can enter the blood. And if you get this right, you guys will be official legends. What part of your brain controls body temperature? I'm waiting. What part of your brain? Thank you. And you're not going to believe this. How many people believe this? That in the hypothalamus, you have prostaglandin receptors. Yeah, it's got receptors coming out of its epiglottis, man. It's got receptors coming out of its gizzard. <laughs> gizzard. That P with the circle is a prostaglandin. Are you with me? And watch. When prostaglandins bind to prostaglandin receptors in the hypothalamus, it changes the normal set point of your body temperature of 98.6 to now you got a fever of 103. How do you know you're going to get a fever? What happens to your skin? Right, your skin becomes cold and pale because all of the blood vessels to your skin are constricted and you're sending all that warm blood to the core to raise your core body temperature to that new set point. Who's with me? You can also shiver because what do contracting muscles produce? Heat, right? So now you got a fever. Tell me you got that. Fever good for you or bad for you? Right. You want a fever that, come on, that goes up, stays up for a while, comes back down, up for a while, stays up, comes back down. Tell me you got that. And here's why. You better write this down. White blood cells kill pathogens better at higher temperatures. Your immune system is more active, responds better at higher temperatures. Anybody here have microbiology yet? Slackers. What? Oh, okay. And you're going to learn that pathogens, the ones that affect humans, tend to grow slower at higher temperatures. So the fever works good because the white blood cells kill the bad guys better and the bacteria and viruses replicate slower at higher temperatures. Tell me you're with me. You're following this. 
all right? So what produced the pain, the increased inflammation, and the fever? That's very good. So you're not going to believe this. Not going to believe it. But guess what ibuprofen prevents white blood cells from producing and releasing? Prostaglandins. Tell me you got that. You better write that down. Ibuprofen prevents the synthesis of prostaglandins by white blood cells. The prostaglandins released by the white blood cells caused inflammation, they cause pain, and they cause fever. That's why ibuprofen can be used as an anti-inflammatory, an analgesic, reduces pain, and an antipyuretic, reduces fever. Who's so, yep. That's correct. How did you know that? Right. Yep, watch. Where do you interpret pain? Come on. In your brain. So you're, write this down. Your brain, your brain produces prostaglandins. The prostaglandins produced in your brain can cause pain. The prostaglandins produced in your brain can also stimulate the hypothalamus and produce fever. That's why Tylenol is not an anti-inflammatory because Tylenol works centrally. It prevents the synthesis of prostaglandins in your brain. So it can be used as an analgesic to reduce pain and it can reduce fever, but it doesn't work as an anti-inflammatory. Now watch, how many people have had elective surgery? You just elect to have surgery. No one's ever had elective surgery? No? Well, I did. I had a hernia repaired about five years ago. Then I saw some people that were former students. And I said to him, I'll just keep pushing it back in. <laughs> but anyways, I had the surgery. And they said, before you had the surgery, you need to stop taking any aspirin or ibuprofen. If you have pain, you can take Tylenol. Because aspirin and ibuprofen, they impact the clotting mechanism and prevent your blood from clotting. So they're anticoagulants. That's why after surgery, they don't give you ibuprofen. They give you Tylenol. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I take some ibuprofen and then like I'll be doing yard work or something. And then I'll bust a blood vessel in my hand. Freaking hurts, man. I'll give you extra credit if you get a 
broken blood vessel in your hand today, right now. Yeah, that's why uh, people who are on um, who take a regular aspirin, people who have heart disease, they'll take an aspirin a day. They bruise easier. Tell me, you got that, Nancy. Tell me they always ask questions about Tylenol and I go all the time, don't they? See. And now you know why they give you Tylenol after surgery. They want to be able to control your bleeding, right? So they're giving you heparin or Lova, uh, Lovenox after surgery. So they don't want you to take aspirin or ibuprofen because that will make it even blood, you know, and your blood less clottable. So they give you Tylenol, hopefully Tylenol number threes. You guys have many Tylenol number threes? That's awful. You know, I've never, believe it or not, never had a narcotic in my life. <laughs> Just so you know, opiates don't do anything for your pain. All they do is make you not care about it. That's why right after surgery, they give you morphine. And the reason they do that is that they know that you're going to care about it, and they want you not to care about it. <laughs> it's the truth, right? You still feel the pain. You just don't care. That's how it works. Isn't that nice? Okay. That's the process of inflammation. All right. So let's say you get through the gateway program. You get a job at, as a nurse in the ER, okay? And someone calls you up and says, look, I sprained my ankle. What do I put on it first, ice or heat? And you're going to tell them, what? Why? Yeah, but inflammation is good for you. Yeah, but why do you put heat if you sprain your ankle? Ah. Are we perfect? Some of us like to think we are. Huh. Watch. Write this down. Write this down. This is good. Your own cells. Oh. Hang on. What the? What the hell is that? Oh. I hate this computer. I emailed them and asked them if I could get my old one back. I don't even understand that. Okay, watch. Your own cells produce prostaglandins and store them. What do prostaglandins do? They cause inflammation. Tell me you're with me. You're following this. If you twist your ankle... These damaged cells in your ankle are going to release prostaglandins. What did I tell you prostaglandins were? Chemoattractants. They attract the white blood cells to the area. So white blood cells don't have eyes, as far as I know. So these little yellow dots are prostaglandins. So when white blood cells come into the area, I don't make them white. When they come into the area, they know to attack and gobble up anything that has prostaglandins attached to it. Tell me you got that. Now watch. What does heat do to the rate of diffusion of molecules? Does it make it go faster or slower? Faster, right? So that area is going to get that initial inflammation, and it's going to be warm. 
and that's going to cause it that could cause some prostaglandins to attach themselves to the surrounding healthy cells. Do you want white blood cells attacking and destroying healthy cells? No, that means it's going to take longer to heal. So after you injure your own tissue, you don't have an invader, you've injured your own tissue. You want to put ice on it to cool that area down so it reduces the spread of those prostaglandins to the surrounding healthy tissue. So that when white blood cells do get to the area, they're going to only eat and destroy the damaged cells. So it will take you less time to heal. You know who will explain that to you? You think I'm lying. Now watch. Now, they tell you the first 48 hours to put ice on it, to reduce this effect. Now, after that effect has gone, after the first 48 hours or so, 72 hours in some cases, depending on how bad it's swollen, watch. Where are the healing elements of the body? Where are they? In your blood. So you put heat on it after, the, after you reduce the initial inflammation to dilate the blood vessels to that area so that more of the healing elements of the blood go to that area and rebuild that tissue. Tell me you got that. Guys? Boom. I just explained to you the process of inflammation and I explained how and why you, uh, the body develops a fever and how acetaminophen, Tylenol, and ibuprofen work to reduce the fever. See, so, uh, guys. So one of the things you're gonna walk away with, hopefully, is now you understand why you put ice on something if you damage your own tissue? What if you got a big boil on your butt? Boy! What do you put? What do you put? Where are the white blood cells? That's why I asked the question. Where are they? They're in the blood. What does heat do to arteries? So if you dilate the arteries, more white blood cells are going to go to the infected area and kill it. That's why when you have an infection, you put heat on it. When you damage your own tissue, you put ice on it. Now, all you have to do is remember that, and you'll know how people need to be treated. Say, so, yeah. Cellulitis? That's underneath. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what is that crust stuff that people get on their legs and their legs? And then, like, they'll be seen, like, some of their legs like, are leaking, and then, like, they get like that. That crusty stuff? Dry. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, dried plasma. There's protein in there, and when you remove the water, when it dries up, it forms like a little, like, crusty thing. Mm. In cellulitis, the skin is actually intact, but the infection is underneath. That's tough to treat. What was your question? Yeah. Um, he, here's why. Uh, one of the things that will happen when you get like an like a boil, for example, if you ever had a boil on your butt, boy, when that thing pops, uh, if you ever seen the inside, the the core of it is actually 
um, a protein coat that house white blood cells and bacteria to prevent it from, from spreading. So what people do is they go in there and they mess with it and then it pops, but the skin doesn't break. And then it allows that bacteria to spread. So what will ultimately happen is the body will do stuff that makes sense and it will continue to try to push that out. And then finally the skin will open. And if it's deep enough, then you have to go in and actually cut it out. But if you ever watch Dr. Pimple Popper, neither do I, but I can imagine that when you um, uh, cut through like a cyst that's infected, there's a core uh, with a, a protein coat on it and a bunch of bacteria and white blood cells. And that's basically walling off the infection so that it doesn't spread. Yep. Um, she had leukemia, right? Um, she had uh, a suppressed immune system. Yeah, that very well could. All it needs is a little irritation and a, a little point of access, and uh, you can get it. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have to, because uh, with an impaired immune system, she could have gone septic from that. Yeah. And you, especially with her, you don't want to be going around um, uh, digging with that because that really could have uh, jacked her up. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, it'll take a long time, but, you know, people have no patience. They want to get it out of them. Um, hang on. Oh, yeah. Hang on. Um. Uh, let's, oh, here we go. This is a back cyst removal. Yeah, here we go. Whoops. Oh, golf. Look at that. I need a 62 degree wedge. That looks like it's alive. Like it would talk to you. Here. So they're giving you a little local anesthetic there. That's pleasant. You ever see these hillbilly uh, uh, cyst removals? <laughs> Where they're like in a kitchen and they're doing it, they're taking like a kitchen knife and doing it? Okay, so watch. Oh, you're kidding. It's not going to let us go to the best part. For real? Hang on. That's what I would say too. Nice. Hang on. Okay. Just watch it. You know what a pyonidal cyst is? You get an infection on the crack of your butt. Man, it's like a freaking volcano of rotten flesh. So I've had to remove some. So you give them a little local, you slice it open, and then you take four by fours and you just push, and that stuff just comes bubbling out. Uh, the smell is disgusting. It's rotting flesh. Yeah, the smell is awful. Like, I don't mind the sights. The smells of what get to me. You know, like GI bleed. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, he's in some pain there. Okay, enough already. You know what I always wonder is how people let it go so bad. You know what I mean? Like one dude had a cyst 
An infected cyst is like the size of a football. Gotta make that hole big enough to pop out that core. And it tunnels too, because it grows towards a blood supply when it gets bad enough. Come on. Oh, he ain't gonna dig it out? Oh, that. Oh, that sucked. All right. Well, you can look at it some other time. Okay, that's that's inflammation, yes? Okay. And then, um, all right. Here we go. All right. What are the functional lymph nodes? Lymph nodes. Right. Lymph nodes, you better write this down. Lymph nodes uh, filter lymph fluid. And their job, and you, you need to know this, all lymph fluid must pass through a lymph node before it gets dumped into the right side of the heart. So all lymph vessels dump their lymph into the right side of the heart, just like veins dump their venous blood in the right side of the heart. So before that lymph fluid gets dumped into the right side of the heart, it's got to be filtered by a lymph node. And it's filtered of any antigens or pathogens. And if the lymph node comes in contact with some antigens or pathogens, then what it does is this. So you've got a bunch of afferent lymph vessels that meet at one lymph node. So think of a lymph node as kind of like security at an airport, doesn't matter where you're coming from, right? Here, 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 you all gotta go through security. And then there's one efferent lymph vessel that carries that filtered lymph back to the right side of the heart. Now, if you got a bacteria here, B for bacteria, when it enters that lymph node, you produce lymphocytes, you produce B cells and T cells that are specific for that antigen or pathogen. Nancy, are you leaving? Okay, be good. You got me? And watch, once those B cells and T cells are produced by the lymphocyte, then they leave the lymph node and they enter the right side of the heart. Where do you want those B cells and T cells to go?
wherever the infection is. And where does arterial blood always go? What, what cells? Where does the vast majority of arterial blood go? That blood's going to go, it's going to take the path of least resistance, right? So the inflammatory response is going to dilate the arteries to that infection. And those, the vast majority of those B cells and T cells that were formed in that lymph node are going to go to that infected area. Tell me you got that. Yes. And these are specific, right? They're, they have to be programmed. How did they get programmed? They come in contact with that specific antigen or pathogen. So B cells and T cells, part of your specific immunity, yes, it's like being at a big party. There's 500 people and you only know one person. So what do you do? You park your car, you go to the bar, you get a couple of drinks, and then you search for that one person you know, ignoring everybody else. So when B cells and T cells are programmed, they're programmed for one specific antigen or pathogen. And they'll ignore everything else, seeking out that one antigen or pathogen that they've been programmed for. Tell me... You got that. Now watch. When lymph nodes are producing B cells and T cells, they become inflamed and swollen. That's called lymph adenopathy. Lymph adenopathy is a swollen lymph node. So if you go to your doctor and you say, doctor, doctor, I have a sore throat. The doctor will say, open, open wide, say, ah, and they'll look at your tonsils in the back of your throat. Then they do one of these. And they're checking for lymph node involvement. And if the doctor knows there's lymph node involvement, then the doctor knows that the local white blood cells can't, they're getting their asses kicked. So they have to, they're programming T cells and B cells. So when you have lymph node involvement, you have a much more severe infection. And that's when a doctor will typically prescribe antibiotics. Now, if there's no lymph node involvement, then it may be early in the infection, but most people don't go when they have an infection that is going to be short-lived. When it lasts longer and it gets pretty bad and you got lymph node involvement, that's when they typically prescribe antibiotics. So they'll actually write lymphadenopathy, cervical lymphadenopathy, or submandibular, and they'll prescribe antibiotics. How many people got that? So in, in that video that I asked you to watch, you learned that T cells, B cells, and those NK cells are specific immunity. They have to be programmed in order to kill specific antigens or pathogens. Say, yeah. Okay. Now watch. Is it appropriate if you have an infection on your hand, bad one? for the doctor to palpate your axillary lymph node. Is that appropriate? Yeah. If you have an infection on your hand, is it appropriate for your doctor to palpate your inguinal lymph node? No, it's time to get a new doctor, right? So, and where are lymph nodes located? Watch. And look, it makes perfect sense. Where are they located? Where do you have lymph nodes? Generally. Are your breasts open to the environment? Yeah, right. You don't have to poke a nipple to feed your kid, right? So you have a bunch of lymph nodes. Write this down. There's an 11th commandment. Did you know that? Thou shall not get bacteria into the central circulation. So watch. Lymph nodes are located in two places. Surrounding the central circulation and openings to the body. 70% of all your lymph nodes are located in your, in your GI tract. That's the largest opening you have in your body. And because there's a redundancy, you have 
adenoids that uh, protect your nasal airway and uh, tonsils that protect your oral airway, you can have those removed because you still have submandibular and cervical lymph nodes that can take over. If that was the only protection you had in terms of your lymphatic system, they could not remove adenoids and tonsils. Otherwise, you'd be walking around getting sick all the time. Surrounding the central circulation, surrounding the heart, and openings to the body. And if you look, all lymph vessels have to filter the lymph through a lymph node before it's dumped into the right side of the heart. That's why when a woman has a mastectomy, they remove the breast tissue, the underlying muscle, and they also remove the associated axillary lymph nodes. If you put a blood pressure cuff on that woman's arm and you pump, pump, pump up the volume, it will force fluid out of the capillaries and into the interstitial space. Normally, that fluid is drained back to the right side of the heart through the lymph system, but you've cut the lymph vessels to remove the lymph nodes. So any fluid that escapes that woman's arm has no way back to the central circulation. So they will get lymphedema. And if you draw blood in that arm, the best protection you have against infection is intact skin. You've unintacted the skin and bacteria has direct access to the right side of the heart. That's why women are told when they have a radical mastectomy that if you cut your hand or something, you need to let your doctor know about it because that can lead to sepsis. And you were telling me now that they don't, you can, you can draw blood in that arm and blood. Right, if you haven't developed lymphedema, usually within the first six months after you've had the surgery, you probably will never develop it. Right, right. Yep. But still, as a rule, you know, if you if a woman's only had one mastectomy, use the other arm just to be safe. And most of them are taught never to give up that arm anyways. Right, right. They don't know why, but even nurses don't know why. They'll say the blood pressure reading is wrong. Yeah, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Tell me you got that, guys. Okay, here we go. All right, gonna do, all right. Okay. I need you to watch that video on the immune system, but I'm gonna uh, do a couple of things. All right, watch. All right, I'll simplify things. B cells, there's a bunch of them floating around in your body, in your lymph. You with me? Embedded in the cell membrane of this B cell are these little receptors. These little receptors are actually antibodies. So antibodies are proteins. You, you follow one so far? So these B cells float around in your blood and lymph until they come in contact with a specific antigen or pathogen. So we're going to say that this is an, some type of antigen. An antigen, as I told you before, is anything that produces an immune response. You got me? So here's a little antigen. And these B cells are going to float around your blood and lymph until they come in contact with it. But more specifically, when they come in contact with the specific B cell that the receptor matches up with. So as you can see, I made this receptor a different shape. So this B cell is going to come in contact with this antigen. Are you with me? And this is important. And when that B cell comes in contact with this antigen, 
it gets turned on. And when it gets turned on, it divides. And it divides into two types of cells. You remember this? You remember it? It divides into memory B cells and plasma B cells. What do you think memory B cells do? <laughs> They remember the specific antigen or pathogen that they came in contact with. Yeah? Plasma B cells then produce specific antibodies. And these specific antibodies that are produced by plasma B cells then circulate around the blood and lymph and look for that specific antigen. And that antibody will then bind to that antigen. That So these are antibodies, and it's going to seek out and find that specific antigen and then bind to it and then mark it for death. Then floating around, floating around, where is it? Floating around, it's floating around someplace. Where is it? Here we go. Watch. You got this flu virus. You got antibodies to it the antibodies will attach to the receptors on the flu vi virus, mark it for death, and then a white blood cell called a monocyte comes in and eats it up. That's part of your specific immunity. Now watch, now watch. And this is important. Oh, where is it? And I cannot see. It has to do with a big leg. Where is it? Just had it. Hang on, what's this? Here we go. Watch. When you're first exposed to something, when you're first exposed to something, you've never been exposed to it before. This process of activating B cells and converting them into memory cells and plasma cells can take weeks or months. In the meantime, you get sick. You following? So on your first exposure to a bacteria or a virus, because you do not have plasma B cells turned on yet, this process can take weeks or months to develop. In the meantime, you get sick. But what do you have lying in wait if on your second exposure? You got memory cells. And these memory cells, when they come in contact with it again, divide into thousands of plasma cells that produce millions of antibi uh, antibodies rapidly. So it can attack and destroy that antigen or pathogen before it can make you sick. No, uh, um, they're separate. 
So you have these memory cells. And these memory cells only live for a certain amount of time. They live for years. But once those memory cells begin to um, decrease in number, then your immunity drops. That's why if when you went into clinical and they uh, checked your measles, mumps, and rubella and varicella vaccine, that if you didn't have enough antibodies, they, they deemed you not immune. So they give you a booster shot. So this would happen to produce more memory cells. That's a tetanus, right? So you get the tetanus, because the same thing happens. Those memory B cells begin to slowly uh, degrade. And in order to be protected, you got to boost the number of memory B cells. Did that make sense? So that's why when you get a vaccine, it's what it actually causes the disease, but it's dead or attenuated. So this process happens. But remember, now you got memory B cells lying in wait. So if you actually get exposed to the real thing, then this process of making plasma B cells and antibodies happens rapidly so you don't get sick. That's how all vaccines work. And the only live vaccine is the smallpox. So you can actually get smallpox from the smallpox vaccine. You can't get flu from the flu vaccine. You can't. But because you're getting an immune response, and one of the functions of the immune system is to produce prostaglandins, prostaglandins are going to produce pain. So that's why uh, little kids will get like muscle aches, right? And the doctor will say they may get a low grade fever, just give them some, you know, ibuprofen or Tylenol, and they may feel cranky for a couple of days because that's the immune system kicking in. But they should not get sick from the vaccine. Tell me, yeah, did that make sense? All right. Yeah, look, watch. The body does stuff that makes sense. If you're sick, the only way that you're going to get well is by resting your body. And your immune system, will, if you're sick enough, will make you rest. It will force you to lay in bed. Boom. So if you can't get out of bed because you're sick, you sick. And when guys are sick, they're the worst, man. They really do. Mm. I'm the worst. And I freely admit it. I own that all day. I was talking to Peggy and she goes, yeah, me and uh, the owner of the company were talking about like when you're sick. Like, you're such a baby. Because I walk around all day. I'm sick and nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I got really sick, you guys are probably too young for this. It was day the Waco compound burned down. It was 1993. Yeah. I was so sick. I had a fever. I could not get off my couch. I rolled off my couch. And then this is no joke. Two weeks prior to that, this girl I used to date, she lived in Chicago. She calls me up. Tim, I'm so sick. I just, I can't even get out of bed. And I'm like, well, what do you need? Well, you know, I could use some like orange juice and some milk. I don't have anything to eat. So I go shopping for her, right? Bring her there, make her some soup. And then two weeks later, I get sick and I call her up and I'm like, I'm really sick and I got nothing to eat. Well, I'm busy. Can't believe that. Then she, yeah. I'll tell you, when I was sick, you know what my first thought was? I want my mom. Yeah. Yeah, guys, like a hangnail put the, most guys in a coma. Like women have a higher pain tolerance than men. There's no two ways about it. They do. Did I tell you I saw this woman at the grocery store? She's holding a baby, feeding it, talking on the phone, holding a legit conversation and writing out a check. I just stood there with my jaw, but I'm like, holy cow. That's incredible. 
I start to panic when they say, do you want paper or plastic? I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm like, Jesus. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. White blood cells can be in the lymph node. Yep. Um, so I asked my son this question last night. When he was little, he was like three or four. Isabel? She likes watching what? Need to have her checked out. Something. <laughs> you know what? You know the people who like watching the videos are the people who don't have to watch them. That's how it works. Okay, ready? Watch. Watch. Oh, you know what? Wait a minute. I got a video on that too. Do you? Okay, watch. I'm going to do this and then you go home. You, you, um, there's going to be questions on this, I guarantee it. Okay? What's this? <sighs> so proud of you guys. Okay? Watch. This is an allergen, right? Not an antigen, an allergen. So an allergy is one time the body does stuff that doesn't make sense. You got me? Now watch. The first time you're exposed to something, B cells are going to do their job. They're going to come in contact with this thing. And then what do the B cells do? Right, memory cells and then plasma B cells. And then what do the plasma B cells produce? Waiting. Waiting. Mm -mm. They produce specific antibodies. You got me? And then the job of the antibody is to circulate around the blood and lymph and attack this guy here. You got me? But watch. In people with allergies, there's an additional step. Watch it. When they produce these, summon up. Come on. When they produce these antibodies, these antibodies attach themselves to mast cells. What do mast cells contain? What? They contain histamine. And this is the important piece. When the antibodies circulate around the blood and the lymph and they come in contact with the allergen, when the antibodies that are attached to mast cells come in contact with the allergen, it causes the mast cell to release histamine. What does histamine do to arteries? It causes massive arterial vasodilation. You got me? What does it do to the capillaries? Makes them leaky. So if you have hay fever, you're allergic to pollen, the pollen enters your nose and your eyes. So if you're allergic to that stuff, your nose becomes stuffy, it runs, your eyes get puffy, and they start to water. Tell me you got that. Now, and I guarantee you that in clinical, if you don't have to know this, I'll give you each one a million dollars. And right now, I don't have a million dollars. Do you know why I don't have a million dollars? Yes, that's exactly right. Otherwise, I'd have a million dollars. They're expensive. Ready? Write this down. 
anaphylaxis is a total body allergic reaction. Isabel, are you writing it down? And she even smiled too. Anaphylaxis is a total body allergic reaction. And in order to get an anaphylactic reaction, the thing that you're allergic to has to be ingested or injected. Are you with me? That means it has to circulate everywhere. Tell me you got that. What's that? That's a B. Look at that. If you're allergic to bees and a bee stings you, they inject bee venom. And where does that bee venom go? It goes all over. Tell me you got that. It circulates all over. On your first time you get stung by a bee, you don't have any B cells sensitized. So are you going to produce a lot of antibodies? So you may not even know that you're allergic to bees. But the second time you get stung, you're going to produce a ton of antibodies. Say yes, second time. And in an allergy, what do those antibodies get attached to? They get attached to mast cells. Where's the bee venom? In the blood. So when the antibodies attack the bee venom that's circulating everywhere in the blood, it's going to cause the massive release of histamine. Where? Everywhere. Everywhere. And what's going to happen? Uh oh, look at that. What's going to happen to all of the arteries throughout your body? And we learned, I'll never forget it. If the resistance to blood flow drops dramatically, what's going to happen to systolic blood pressure? It's going to drop. And if you don't have a mean arterial blood pressure of at least 60, you are in what? Shock. What caused the shock? A total body allergic reaction. What's the word to describe a total body allergic reaction? Anaphylaxis. So you are in anaphylactic shock. What's the treatment? Epinephrine. Because what? What's that? Yeah, they do. But your first emergency treatment is what? Epinephrine. Because what does epinephrine do to all of your blood vessels throughout your body? It constricts them. Tell me you got that. And you're, I, I said it. I said I made sure I said it. I told you that the airway is very vascular. Didn't I tell you that? So all of the blood vessels in your airway are going to dilate. So it's going to begin to close your throat off. And people say, when I got bit, stung by that bee, it felt like my throat was closing off. That's because it is closing off. Epinephrine. Then they give them Benadryl to re, uh, prevent the mast cells from releasing any more histamine. And then it's an overreaction of the immune system. And what suppresses the immune system? Steroids. That's why they're placed on low-dose steroids right? High dose and then step you down and we know why that is. Tell me you got that. But the emergency drug treatment for anaphylaxis, uh, anaphylactic shock is epinephrine. That's why people who are allergic, they carry EpiPen. Say, so, yeah, that's anaphylactic shock. I teach a pathophysiology class and the student said the emergency treatment is Benadryl. I said, they'll be dead in the morgue but the mast cells won't release any more histamine. 
Uh, no, it used to be uh, in class. I'm gonna teach it. Uh, I'm gonna teach it blended. So you guys, when the nursing program, you take it between your second and third semester, because I review all this stuff. So when you get in the third and fourth semester, where you become an RN, where things get tough, you get all this reviewed. So you come in there and you have a good shot. You got it. All right, ambulate home. Uh, do me. You won't. Yes. Yep. What's that? <laughs>